Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone, and thank you for joining us. I would like to welcome you to the second plenary of the 2020 North American CF Conference. As noted yesterday, this has been a tumultuous year for all of us, including the CF clinical research community. The impact of COVID-19 was significant as most clinical research had to either pause or rapidly adapt to the changing conditions brought to us by the pandemic. Thankfully, the clinical research community, both investigators and study participants, were able to rapidly pivot and continue to do the important work of advancing studies in support of new CF therapies. This second plenary will focus on the impact of the, that highly effective modulators like Trikafta have had on CF from both a scientific and a personal perspective. It is hard to believe that yesterday marked the one-year anniversary of the approval of Trikafta in the U.S., targeting the most common CF-causing mutation, Delta F508. Over the past year, there has been amazing progress in our understanding of the benefits of highly effective CFTR modulators. It also appears that this progress in science may be accompanied by progress in access in many countries. For these reasons, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce the plenary number two speaker for the North American Conference this year, Dr. Jennifer Taylor Kauser. Dr. Taylor Kauser has had a long and impressive career. I'd like to highlight a few of her accomplishments and leadership roles within the CF care and research community. Jen received her undergraduate degree at Stanford in human biology, and then she attended Duke University where she obtained her medical degree, completing her residency in both medicine and pediatrics and subsequent fellowship in adult and pediatric pulmonary medicine. Her research interests include developing new therapies to treat CF and to understand and improve women's health care in CF. Jen has been the site principal investigator for greater than 40 clinical trials and the global lead of three clinical trials, including studies of Trikafta. She has published over 75 scientific articles and holds important national leadership roles for the American Thoracic Society and the CIA Foundation. She is a regularly requested speaker across three continents. And when she is in Colorado, she's the medical director of the Clinical Research Services. She is the co-director of the Adult CF Care Program. And she is the director of the CFTDN site centered at National Jewish Health. Jen is truly a ceiling breaker becoming the first black woman to be promoted to professor in the history of national Jewish health. She is a mentor and inspiration to many, including trainees and colleagues worldwide. When she's not making the world better for the CF community, she has some pretty interesting hobbies. These include the care and training of four adorable Rhodesian Ridgebacks, one of which actually had eight new puppies, and a leading role in the pulmonary care of orangutans worldwide. Thank you, Dr. Taylor Kauser, for speaking with us today and for all that you do for the CF community. Thank you, Dr. Clancy, for that very kind introduction. And thank you to you, to Dr. Boyle, and to the NACFC Conference Planning Committee for the opportunity to speak today. Back in January, when Dr. Clancy called, the world was a very different place. So I'm even more honored today to have the opportunity to speak to you about some of the things that we have to celebrate in 2020. And I really appreciate all of you being flexible and being willing to join us online instead of in Phoenix where we all wanted to be. Recently, Dr. Boyle announced the five-year Cystic Fibrosis Foundation strategic plan, the pillars of which are cure, care, and community. Yesterday's plenary really focused on cure, and today I'll be focusing on care and community. These are my disclosures, and these are today's learning objectives. Last year, when we all gathered in Nashville, we were incredibly excited about the approval of Alexacaptor, Tezacaptor, Ivacaptor. Trikafta here in the US and Captrio in Europe and the UK. At that point, we were really anticipating what the future might look like with the majority of people with CF on highly effective CFTR modulators. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the glimpse we've seen of the new CF over the last year. 
To make sure that we're all on the same page, I'm actually going to review the data that led to the approval, as well as some new data that supports the approval and looks at longer term data. Although the approval was based on data from people with one or two copies of F508 Dell, in the interest of time, I'll be focusing today on the data from one copy of F508 Dell and a minimal function mutation. Two notes for housekeeping. One, throughout the presentation, rather than repeatedly saying Alexacaptor, Tezacaptor, Avicaptor, I will refer to Alexacaptor, Tezacaptor, Avicaptor, Tricapta as either Alex Teziva or ETI. Another note is that on many of the slides, I've included abstracts that are being presented here at the North American CFC meeting. Those abstracts are relevant to the data in the slides or some of the data that's being supported by those abstracts. So as many of you will remember, this study was a double-blinded, randomized, placebo-controlled, multi-center international study evaluating Alex Teziva in people with one copy of F508 Dell and a minimal function mutation. So one that doesn't produce protein or is expected not to respond in vitro to modulators. The primary outcome of this study was our measure of one function, the absolute change in percent predicted FEV1. So on the y-axis is the absolute change in percent predicted FV1. You can see that in the treated group in yellow, there was a very rapid and substantial improvement in percent predicted FV1 compared to the placebo in white, where there was a slow sort of decline. Similarly, for sweat chloride, our measure of cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator or CHER function, there was also a very rapid and substantial improvement in those in the treatment group. That's shown on the y-axis. And over time, there was a relatively stable sweat chloride in those who were in the placebo group. There was also an impact on pulmonary exacerbations. This is critically important because we know from data in the USCF patient registry that about 25% of people who experience an exacerbation will not return to baseline. So in other words, every single time someone has a pulmonary exacerbation, they are at risk for permanent lung function loss. In this phase three study, on the y-axis is a proportion of patients without a pulmonary exacerbation. You can see that in the treated group, there were less exacerbations. In fact, there was a 63% reduction in pulmonary exacerbations. Now, of course, this data is for the first six months of the study. Both people with one copy and two copies of F508 Dell were allowed to roll into open label study. So the open label study is people on active drug. On this graph, again, I'm showing you the absolute change in percent predicted FV1. On the left side of the graph is actually the randomized portion of the trial. On the right side of the graph is the open label portion. So again, for the absolute change in percent predicted FV1 on the y-axis, you can see that there was that rapid improvement in the treated group, and that was sustained over the first 24 weeks of the open label study. For those who were in the placebo group, again, there was that slight decline, but when they rolled over into open label, there was a rapid and substantial improvement, and that was sustained over the first 24 weeks of the open label study. Similarly, for sweat chloride, there was a rapid and substantial change in those in the treatment group that was sustained over the first six weeks, first six months of the study, and that was sustained over the first six months of the open label trial. Additionally, in the placebo group, there was that stable or flat sweat chloride, and then when they rolled into open label or active drug, there was that rapid and substantial drop, and that was sustained over the first 24 weeks of the open label study. So this really supports the longer term use of Alex Teziva in people with CF. Additionally, this study is ongoing. So we'll have several years of data looking at the sustainability of these changes. Now in the US, we were incredibly fortunate to receive Federal Drug Administration or FDA approval to prescribe Alex Teziva to anyone with CF who has at least one copy of F508 Dell. 
that was given with the idea that we would actually test Alexa's IVA in those who have one copy of F508 DEL and a residual function mutation, one that confers some ability to, to transport chloride, and in those with gating mutations like G551B. So in this study, people were already on either Tez IVA or IVA based on their mutations. They were then randomized to either receive Alex Tez IVA or to continue on their Tez IVA or IVA based on their mutations. After the eight weeks of the randomized portion of the trial, they were then allowed to roll into open label if they chose to do so. This data has not yet been published. However, there was a press release that showed us this important information. So in those people who already had improvements because of Tez IVA or IVA alone, there was an additional 3.7% improvement in lung function. Additionally, there was also a 22.3 millimole per liter drop in sweat chloride on top of the benefit they've already seen from Tez IVA or IVA alone, really supporting the use of Alex Tez IVA in any woman with CF who has at least one copy of F508 DEL. Many of you have heard us refer to Alex Tez IVA as highly effective modulator therapy. And what do we really mean by that? So first I'd like to focus on the top portion of the graph where we're looking at the absolute improvement in percent predicted FV1, our measure of lung function in cystic fibrosis. On the bottom portion of the graph is the absolute change in sweat chloride, our measure of CFTR function. If you focus first on the left-hand column in people with the G551D mutation, you'll see that there was a large improvement in lung function of 10.6%. And that was accompanied by a decrease in sweat chloride, our measure of CFTR function of 48.1 millimoles per liter. So a large improvement in lung function accompanied by a large improvement in CFTR function. So this was really our benchmark for highly effective modulator therapy. Now, if you go to the middle of the graph and look at those people who had two copies of F508 DEL, I've first shown you in aqua the effect of a more modestly effective CFTR modulator. So in people with two copies of F508 DEL, there was an improvement of 4% in lung function and an improvement of 10.1 in sweat chloride. So again, much more modestly effective than our benchmark use of Ivacaptor in people with G551D mutations. Now, if you focus on what happened when people with two copies of F508 DEL received a Lex Tez IVA, you can see that on top of the 4% improvement with Tez IVA alone, there was an additional 10% improvement in lung function. And on top of the 10.1 millimole per liter decrease in sweat chloride, there was an additional 45 millimole per liter decrease in sweat chloride. So again, a substantial improvement in lung function accompanied by a substantial improvement in CFTR function. And of course, we saw similar results in people with one copy of F508 DEL and a minimal function mutation. So that's what we really mean by highly effective CFTR modulator therapy. We are changing lung function and CFTR function substantially. So let's step up back to 2011. At that point, we really had made a difference in the lives of people with CF. We were treating people with CF-specific therapies. However, at that time, all of our treatments were based on the signs and symptoms of CF. There wasn't a treatment for the basic defect. Then in 2012, we had approval of a highly effective modulator for about 4% of the CF population. Then in 2015 and 2016, we had approval of more modestly effective modulators for people with two copies of F508 DEL, so about half of the CF population. Then in the US in 2019, we had the approval of highly effective CFTR modulators for the majority of people with CF. So in a very short period of time, we went from treating the signs and symptoms for most people to treating the basic defect. So I've really given you the data, the numbers, but I think it's important to have the perspective of somebody with CF. So I'm gonna turn it over to Lauren for her perspective on highly effective modular therapy. I 
one of those people with CF who's just always been sick. I needed routine hospitalizations, was on IVs, you know, four to six times a year. Some, you know, as I got older, that would be eight or nine times a year. In law school is where I suffered probably the most. I was really, really sick in law school and, and in stage by the time I graduated. My son's adoption was finalized within the same six hour period that Tri-Captain was approved. And it was, it was just such an amazing moment because we'd worked so hard to make it through the adoption process. And then we'd worked so hard to keep me healthy enough to be able to actually engage in adoption. My husband and I pulled over to the side of the road and you know, we kissed and we're crying and we're crying with John Henry and it was, it was, it's, it's a day I'll never forget. Very exciting. 33 years in making. I think every aspect of my life has changed. I mean, my lung function has nearly doubled. I am no longer oxygen dependent, either during the day or at night. I can hold my son, I can play with him, I can walk up the stairs, I can drive. There are massive things like lung function, but there are also all of these little things that you probably take for granted, like being able to carry in groceries that I really even forgot that I couldn't do. Make way, yelled a limousine, the longest car you've ever seen. A year ago today, I knew I was not going to live long enough for my son to know who I was. And we went into adoption, understanding that, you know, it was very unlikely I was going to make it to my 40s. We would, we would try. And so all of a sudden, I got my life back, right? And, you know, I know I'm going to be there the first day when he goes to school. I'm going to see him grow up. I wanted to go back to work full time, which I did. I started running again. I want to train for half a marathon. I want to be a partner in my law firm. I want to travel again. I want to retire. I want to become a partner, and then I want to, I want to retire from that. But now I, I have a whole lifetime ahead of me. I could say anything to researcher, scientists. Thank you. I mean, I don't know how I lived for so long. You should be really proud of what you did. You did a really, really amazing scientific and professional thing. And I know the CF community is extremely grateful for it. And I'm grateful for it. And my family is. And someday when my son understands the magnitude of what this drug has done for me, he'll be grateful for it too. Thank you so much, Lauren, for being willing to give us your perspective on how impactful highly effective modular therapy has been in your life. So of course, we know that clinical trials are critically important in the pathway to approval of new drugs. However, they always only focus on a small group of people and not the whole group of people who will eventually be treated. We can and have learned a great deal from what we call real world studies. They're observational studies that look at many aspects of a person's health over time after they start a new therapy. Because we've already talked about the impact of Alexthez IVA on lung function and sweat chloride, and because Dr. Friedman will be talking to you tomorrow about the gastrointestinal impacts of highly effective modulator therapy, I'm really gonna focus on other aspects of ongoing and upcoming real world studies. So PROMISE, a prospective study to evaluate biological and clinical effects of significantly corrected CFTR is being led by Dr. Steve Rowe and Dave Nichols. Their goal is really to understand the holistic responses of people to highly effective modulator therapy, so beyond just the clinical trial measures. Of course, conduct of clinical research was impeded by the pandemic, but fortunately they do have some early data that they're able to share with us today. So we know that a major complication of CF is chronic airway infection. 
early results of the impact of highly effective modular therapy on chronic infection were mixed. One study showed no impact and another showed early impact with later rebound. Long-term registry studies of people on Ivacaptor actually have been more promising about the impact of highly effective modular therapy on microbiology, but promise will really give us a great perspective in a large number of people. If you focus first on the graph on the left, we're looking at colony forming units or CFUs, the amount of bacteria in someone's sputum for pseudomonas. At zero months on the x-axis is baseline, and then at one month is one month of treatment of Alex Teziva. You can see that while the majority of people remained or became culture positive, 33% actually became culture negative. Similarly for Staph aureus, if you focus again on the y-axis, which is CFUs, the amount of bacteria in someone's sputum, you can see that while 88% remained or became culture positive, 12% became culture negative. So of course our questions are, did we really eradicate bacteria over that first month? Are these results sustainable? Will chronic infection continue to impact lung function over time? These questions will be answered in the upcoming years of the PROMISE study. Another aspect of CF is the thick, sticky mucus that's very difficult to clear from people's lungs. Dr. Scott Donaldson is doing a sub-study of PROMISE that looks at mucus clearance and the properties of mucus. In this first graph on the y-axis, we're looking at clearance of mucus from someone's lung. In baseline, we're looking at the average baseline clearance of mucus from someone's lung. And then in blue is the impact after one month of Alex Teziva. You can see that there was a big increase in the ability of people to clear mucus from their lungs based on one month of Alex Teziva use. The other issue that they're studying is mucus properties. So one of those properties in mucus of people with CF is percent solids, so how much of the mucus is made of solids. Again, at baseline, you can see in gray, and then after one month of treatment with Alex Teziva, you can see that there was a decrease in the percent solids in someone's mucus. So we're proving both the ability of people to clear mucus and the properties of mucus with just a short period of time on Alex Teziva. And again, this study is ongoing, so we'll see if these results are sustainable. Now, of course, the PROMIS study is being done here in the US, but there's a similar study called RECOVER that's being done in the UK and Europe. It's being led by Drs. Paul McNally and James Davies, and they're focusing on many similar outcomes that the PROMIS study is focusing on. However, they have a focus for their primary endpoint on lung clearance index, so how much gas you can clear out of your lungs. It's a very sensitive measure of lung function. They're also doing CT scans of the lungs to see how those things change over time on highly effective modular therapy. Another aspect of CF for many people, particularly adults with CF, is chronic sinus disease. Based on the US CF patient registry, over half of adults have sinus disease that is symptomatic and often can be seen on radiology like CT scans. Our objective in this study was to determine both objectively by CT scan and subjectively by symptom scores whether or not Alex Teziva can improve sinus disease. Radiologists at National Jewish have used computer software programs to be able to actually use machine learning to analyze the amount of opacification, mucus plugging and infection on someone's sinus CT scan. So if you focus on the image on the left and look at baseline, I've outlined in red the areas where there's a lot of mucus plugging and infection, which shows up as gray rather than black, which is air. You can see on the right side that after six months of treatment with Alex Teziva, there was a substantial improvement in this person's CT scan in the mucus plugging and infection because now there is more black or air in the sinuses. Overall in the study so far, what we've seen is that Alex Teziva treatment for six months led to an opacification improvement of almost 24%. Importantly, this was accompanied by a decrease in sinus, sinus symptoms. So on the y-axis is a mean SNOT22 score, which is a measure of someone's sinus symptoms. A lower score is better. 
So in the first month, there was a statistically significant decrease in sinus symptoms based on this scoring. And in fact, that exceeded the minimally clinically important difference of 8.9 points. And not only did that happen in the first month, but it was sustained over the course of six months. We will be following these people out for two years to see if these results are sustainable. Additionally, Dr. Esther Blatter is obtaining nasal cells to study cellular level and RNA changes in people who are treated with Alex Teziva. Another group that we've had to basically study in the real world because they were left out of phase three studies are people with advanced lung disease. So in the phase three studies of Ivacaftor, in the first four lines of this table, I'm showing you the impact of Ivacaftor on people who had advanced lung disease. If you focus on the column FV1, you can see that there was an increase in people who had advanced lung disease in spite of the fact that their disease was quite severe. So although these results generally didn't meet the same heightened lung function of 10.6% that we saw in the phase three trials, people did actually have improvement in their lung function. Now, of course, with the Alex Teziva trials, they also excluded people with lung function less than 40%. But at this meeting, Birmingham and colleagues have shown that in 64 people with advanced lung disease, there was an improvement of 8.2% in their lung function. So even in the setting of severe disease, people's lung function improved. So with that approval in people who have advanced lung disease, one might ask, can we delay the time to transplant? This table is showing a number of transplants on the y-axis, and then on the x-axis is the year of transplant. In purple are people who are transplanted for CF, and in white are people who are transplanted for COPD or emphysema. You can see that over time, transplants in CF have been relatively stable. But then, if you focus on 2020, you can see that although we know transplants were impacted by the COVID pandemic, and this is just data from the first three quarters of the year, if you look at CF transplants, they are far lower than what we'd expect to be impacted just by the pandemic and by the fact that this is three quarters of the data, suggesting that in people with advanced lung disease, we may actually be prolonging the need for transplant. Thus far, we really focused on the impact of highly effective modular therapy on the respiratory system. So the question is, are there impacts beyond the respiratory system? And the answer is yes. In the phase three studies, we measured quality of life. The way we measure quality of life scores in people with CF is by asking them to fill out questionnaires about their signs and symptoms of CF to determine if those signs and symptoms are improving. In this first graph, I'm showing you on the y-axis, the absolute change in the CF specific quality of life and I'm specifically focusing on respiratory scores. So in people with one copy of F508 Dell, there was a rapid improvement in quality of life that was sustained over the first six months of the trial, and that was also sustained over the open label portion of the trial. In people in the placebo group, you can see that there was a slight decline in quality of life that rapidly improved when people went on open label drug. Importantly, for people with two copies of F508 Dell who were already on a modestly effective modulator for the most part, there was also a rapid and sustained improvement in quality of life. So clearly from what Lauren told us and from that data, there is an improvement in quality of life in people being treated with highly effective CFTR modulation. But there's a question about whether or not there could be an impact in the brain. The first question, of course, is, is there CFTR in the brain? And Guo and colleagues actually asked that question. We know, of course, that there's CFTR in the gut of people with CF, so they measured that for comparison. And you can see that although the levels were lower in the brain, there are actually levels of CFTR in the brain in all of the areas that are outlined on the diagram. Of course, at this point, 
We haven't really studied the impact of CFTR modulators on the brain, but fortunately, the Dublin 3 study will actually be looking at that question. They'll study people who start Alexthesiva and ask them questions about their anxiety and depression, as well as other neuropsychological outcomes. So even before the approval of Alexthesiva, we know from data from the US CF patient registry that more than half of adults with CF have either part-time or full-time employment. Additionally, almost 40% have a college degree. The CF Legal Information Hotline provides information on legal matters to people with CF, including things like insurance and employment. We heard from Lauren that she felt so much better that she wanted to go back to work full time. So the CF Legal Hotline team asked themselves, are calls increasing because people are feeling so much better on Alexthesiva? So on the Y axis is work inquiries as a percent of the total calls to the CF Information Hotline. On the X axis is the year and the month of the calls. You can see that in October of 2019, less than 5% of the calls were work-related. But over time, as people were feeling better and better on Alexthesiva, those calls to the CF hotline about returning to work or going to work full-time actually increased substantially. Of course, the COVID pandemic hit its peak and that did adversely impact the number of calls that were coming in about work. But generally, you can really tell that people were feeling so much better that they either wanted to go back to work or increase their work hours. Another impact of making people feel better and have the prospect of living longer is on parenthood. Across the world, studies have shown that people with CF are more and more considering the idea of becoming parents. But what do we know about fertility in CF? In women with CF, there's a great deal of CFTR in the cervix. So many women with CF have very thick, sticky mucus in their cervix that's also pH imbalanced. However, the majority of women are physically able to become pregnant. On the other hand, 97 to 98% of men with CF are infertile as a result of congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens, or CBAVD, which means that although men with CF make and store sperm, they do not have the ducts that are able to transport the sperm to fertilize the egg. We do think that highly effective modulator therapy will positively impact fertility, in other words, make women more fertile as it impacts the CFTR in the cervix and makes the mucus less thick and less sticky and more pH balanced. On the other hand, in men with CF, because they are born without the ducts to transport sperm, we do not think that highly effective modular therapy will impact fertility. However, many men with CF are still considering parenthood through reproductive assisted techniques. I don't want you just to take my word for it. I'm gonna turn it over to John and Chelsea so they can talk to you about highly effective modular therapy and its impact on their decision to become parents. Chelsea and I met um, while working um, jobs at the, the business school at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Our first date was at a pizza place up in Boulder and it was a really sweet and fun date and we were the only people in there. <laughs> but it was a wildly successful place. It just happened to be serendipitous. After learning that John had cystic fibrosis, it didn't change how I felt about him at all. Felt very special to have been let into this group of people who knew something that he wasn't as vocal about sharing. And so that intensified our bond. And in my mind, he had already seemed perfect and it really didn't change my opinion of him. When Chelsea and I um, finally started talking about or thinking about family planning, um, the challenges that exist with CF um, immediately came up. We decided to put the family planning piece on hold until we could see what type of impact the CFTR modulators that were, were coming would have with me. Since taking Trikafta, um, the, the impact has, you know, been, has far surpassed, I think, any expectations I have. Um, I feel better at work, I sleep better, um, my day-to-day, -day, I have more energy. 
Even though Tricapta doesn't directly impact um, or improve my reproductive health, it has completely revolutionized how I think about family planning. You know, promise that I'll be here for my wife, for my kids. I want to teach them to ride their bike, take them on their first run, be there for sporting events. I have the utmost confidence that I have the best possible chance ever um, to, to do that. Before Trikafta, John added exercise and very intense and long aerobic exercises as part of his treatment. So, you know, there's a lot of pressure to consistently be running or on his bike. I can see that there is a lot less stress in needing to spend those hours working out. That's given me confidence to know that John does have more time and space in his life to want to have kids. And that's made it easier for me to know that, you know, we this is something that we can do together. As the, the reality hits of, um, you know, being able to, to approach family planning and think about having kids, seeing my, my sister and brother-in-law with, with their two kids now, um, we, we get to see the, the highs and the lows. Um, I'm not sure if they'd be actually lows, but um, getting to see yeah, all the challenges that are involved. We also have to recognize how cool it is to be able to, to have that opportunity. I'm literally at a loss for words. Um, the amount of gratitude I have for everybody involved is, is through the roof. You've literally transformed my life. You've transformed, you know, my life with my my wife, um, what my future looks like. It's a it's an orphan disease in a lot of ways. And so there wasn't a whole lot of drive behind getting this developed. And still these people put in their time and their energy and their money. And it has had such a great impact on our lives for the better. I all I would say is thank you, thank you, thank you. So thank you so much to John and Chelsea for being willing to talk about the very personal issue of parenthood and the impact of highly effective modulator therapy. So of course, I said that men with CF are thinking about parenthood as are women with CF. And we know based on the US CF patient registry, the number of pregnancies in women with CF is actually increasing. So on the y-axis is the number of pregnancies, and on the x-axis is the year. So back in 1999, there were only 137 pregnancies reported for women with CF. And then in 2019, there were 319 pregnancies reported, so a much bigger number. And we're expecting what many people are calling the trikafta baby boom as people feel better and better on Alex Teziva. Importantly, most of what we know about CF and pregnancy is from older data at single center sites. Also, there isn't a lot of data on the effect of modulators in pregnancy and in lactation. Although data from animal models shows that at normal human doses, we don't see any concerning adverse effects, there's really a paucity of data of Alexteziva in women with CF who become pregnant. Therefore, we're going to be conducting the Mayflower study, maternal and fetal outcomes in the era of modulators. The goal of this prospective multi-center study in women with CF who become pregnant is to determine the impact of pregnancy in the setting of CF on maternal health, on obstetrical and infant outcomes, and on pharmacokinetics of modulators in pregnancy and lactation, as well as the impact of glucose control. This study we hope to start in the spring of 2021. So clearly, highly effective modulator therapy has had impacts that are profound beyond just lung function. But what impact has it had on standard of care therapies? Of course, the phase three trials were really done with people on their standard of care therapies. But many people are asking, do we still need all of these therapies? One group of people that is definitely asking if all of the standard of care therapies are still necessary is the group of people with CF. CF Community Voice is composed of more than a thousand people with CF and their families, and they're giving us their opinions on important research questions and aspects of care. One place where Community Voice was critical was in this question about withdrawal of therapies. So the CF Learning Network, a collaboration between the CF Foundation and CF Centers, really aims at improving quality of care. 
they set out to ask from both people with CF and from providers, what do you think about studying the withdrawal of therapies? So if you focus first on the left side of the graph, you can see that people with CF and their caregivers gave answers on different types of therapies. So in gray is not interested, in aqua is somewhat interested, and in purple is very interested. So if you look at drugs like hypertonic saline and Dornase Alpha, people were somewhat to very interested in studying withdrawal of therapy. However, for therapies like supplemental feeding, you can see that people were less interested about studying withdrawal of therapy for that particular therapy. On the other hand, if you focus on the right side, you can see that providers were generally somewhat interested to very interested in studying all of the therapies that we use in CF and determining whether it was safe to withdraw them. So the investigators concluded that the bottom line is that providers were more interested in studying withdrawal of therapy than people with CF and their caregivers. However, this gave us some great data about what the first study should be to study withdrawal of therapy. And that study is the Simplify study. So the Simplify study is going to be a randomized trial of withdrawal of either hypertonic saline and or Dornase Alpha. It's being led by Dr. Alex Gifford, Dave Nichols, and Nicole Hamlet. And their primary question for the first part of the study is, is withdrawing hypertonic saline non-inferior to remaining on hypertonic saline as measured by percent predicted FV1? So in other words, if someone withdraws their hypertonic saline, will their lung function remain about the same? Similarly, for part B, for Dornase Alpha, they'll ask, is withdrawing Dornase Alpha non-inferior to remaining on Dornase Alpha as measured by percent predicted FV1? So if I stop my Dornase Alpha, does my lung function stay about the same? Now that study is being done here in the US. In the UK, there's a study called CF Storm. It's going to be led by Drs. Kevin Southern and Gwyneth Davis. They aren't randomizing people in that study, but they are going to study them over 12 months and ask the question, is it safe to withdraw hypertonic saline or Dornase Alpha? So from these two studies, over the next couple of years, we'll find out for people who are using highly effective modulator therapy, is it safe to stop hypertonic saline or Dornase Alpha? Another study that was done in anticipation of the changing use of therapies in people with CF was the HERO study, Home Reported Outcome Study. This was a pilot study to determine whether or not people would be willing to give consent using an app on their phone and then answer questions about treatment and symptoms. What they found was that 63 people with CF and their families were willing to enroll representing 23 states and almost 77% of the tracking participants were active in all six weeks of the study. And researchers, researchers were able to collect over 24,000 data points on treatments or symptoms during the study. So it really proved that yes, you can use this sort of app to study symptoms and treatments over time. The HERO2 study is being led by Dr. Cindy Brown and Clement Wren and was designed in conjunction with the CF Foundation and people with CF and their families. In this study, they'll study the use of therapies over 12 months in people who are on highly effective modulator therapy, and they'll be able to link that data to outcomes in the CF patient registry. So I've talked a lot about all the things we have to be excited about with the majority of people with CF on highly effective modulator therapy. But of course, we have more work to do to get effective therapies to everyone. Currently, Alex Iva is approved down to the age of 12. However, we recently heard in a press release that the study in kids 6 to 11 years of age of Alex Iva has been completed. And in fact, the drug was efficacious, so it worked well and was safe in this age group. So we're hoping to hear over the upcoming months that Alextez Iva is approved down to age six here in the US. We also know that in the US, Iva is actually approved down to age four months. So one of the questions we have is, can you actually prevent complication of CF if drugs are given quite early? 
Researchers who looked at this question in Iowa asked if we use an animal model, can we actually prevent disease? So most of you are very familiar with the CF mouse model. But we also have a CF ferret model. And we've been using this model to study the effects of CF as well as possible treatments for CF. So in the study, again, they were asking, what about really early treatment of highly effective modulators? So they used pregnant CF ferrets who had either two copies of G551D or one copy of G51D and a knockout mutation, one that has no CFGR function, so it's similar to a minimal function mutation. So if you focus first on panel A, in this panel, we're looking at an animal who has two copies of normal CFTR, so wild type, wild type. And if you focus on the boxed areas, you can see that this animal actually has a normal vas deferens and a normal corpus. The corpus is part of the epididymis where sperm are stored. Now, if you focus on panel B, this animal has two copies of a non-functional CF gene, so knockout, knockout, the equivalent of two minimal function mutations. Again, if you focus on the boxes, you can see that there is no vas deferens and there is no corpus. Now, if you focus on panel D, in this animal, a pregnant ferret was treated, treated throughout pregnancy with VX770, which is Ivacaftor. The animal had G551D and one knockout mutation. And you can see that even when the animal was treated throughout pregnancy, the offspring still did not have a vas or a corpus. Now, focusing on panel F, in this animal, this animal had two copies of G551D. And again, the mom was treated throughout pregnancy with VX770, Ivacaptor. And in this case, if you focus on the boxes, you can see that with this very, very early treatment of a highly effective modulator, there was actually formation of the vas and the corpus. So this tells us that we can possibly prevent the complications of CF by giving very early treatment with highly effective modulator therapy. Now, of course, this was done in animals. What we really need to know is can this impact occur in young children with cystic fibrosis? And for this reason, we'll do the BEGIN study. The BEGIN study is going to be very similar to PROMISE. It will be led by Dr. Sonia Helchi, Lucas Hoffman, Bonnie Ramsey, and Michael Stalvey. In this study, of course, we can't yet study the effect of highly effective modulators. So part A of the study is really going to focus on the natural history of these outcomes in young children with CF. Then in part B, hopefully when highly effective modular therapy is approved in this group, they'll study the impact of highly effective modular therapy on those outcomes. What we hope to see is that if you start highly effective modular therapy very early in someone's life, we can actually prevent some of the complications of CF. So of course, Alex Heziva is approved for people with at of f 508 del the most common mutation CF. But we know that there are more than 2,000 mutations in the CF gene, most of which are quite rare. The purpose of the CF Therapeutics Lab Cell Bank is to obtain cells from people with rare mutations. So they isolate and expand or make copies of human cells to send to researchers all over the world. Right now, their focus is on rare variants. So they're trying to obtain primary cells from donors with nonsense and other rare CFTR variants from the blood, from nasal sam samples, and from the rectum. They're also studying genotypes that cannot be treated with the available CFTR modulators. And again, the goal is really so these cells can be an invaluable resource for research, drug discovery, and therapeutic development. One of the things that they've been able to do is something called therotyping. So in therotyping, you use a known modulator and give it to cells that are containing a rare variant. So in this example, I've shown those cells that are containing variants that have less than 10% of wild type at baseline. 
At this point, the lab has tested over or almost 500 variants, but this is just those that have less than 10% of normal CFTR function at baseline. And you can see that with Alexa's IVA treatment, some of those variants were actually able to respond anywhere from more than 10% of normal CFTR function to more than 30% of, of wild type or normal CFTR function, showing us that some rare variants that are non F508 DEL can respond to Alexa's IVA. And there's precedent with the FDA to use such data to expand the use of modulators to people with rare variants. And right now, there's an application that's being reviewed by the FDA to determine whether or not we can expand the use of Alexa-Tesiva beyond just those people who have one copy of f 508 Dell. Another approach to personalized medicine is being done by the HIT-CF group in Europe. They are actually taking rectal biopsies from people with rare CF variants and creating intestinal organoids, or basically mini guts. And what they're doing is plating those mini guts and then testing different modulators against those rare variants. If you focus on the box with the patients, you can see that for patient one at baseline, there is no swelling indicating that there's no CFGR function. But when there is actually the addition of a modulator, those little mini guts swell, indicating that the modulator is actually working. As opposed to patient two, where at baseline there's no swelling, so no function of CFTR, and even with the addition of the modulator, there's still no function of CFTR. So they are actually using this data in cells to decide which patients go into a clinical trial. So those who have a response in their mini guts are then put into a clinical trial to determine whether or not clinical improvements correlate with the improvement in mini guts. And this study is ongoing in Europe. So I've really spoken to you for most of this talk about the use of highly effective modulators, which we don't think will work for most nonsense or stop mutations. So in a nonsense or stop mutation, the cell is told, stop making this protein. So you don't get full length functional CFTR. But there are agents called read-through agents, such as ELX02, and that actually tells the cell, ignore that stop message and keep making the protein. In this graph, I'm showing you that ELX02 was in fact infect effective at increasing concentrations and increasing full-length proteins shown on the y-axis. And this has actually been tested in multiple different nonsense mutations, including G542X. They are continuing to test this drug in other cells having these very rare nonsense mutations. But fortunately, because the data in vitro in cells was so good for G542X, there is an ongoing phase two trial trying to determine whether G542X can be treated with ELX02 safely and effectively. And hopefully next year we'll have data from that study. Another group of people who may have less access to modular therapy because of their rare mutations are people of color. Most of us were taught in our CF training that CF is the most common lethal genetic disorder in Caucasians, which is absolutely true. However, the use of this statement repeatedly in the literature has led to the misperception that CF only occurs in whites, and that has led to late diagnosis in people of color. By 2010, we have newborn screening in every single state because we know that early diagnosis and treatment improves outcome. There is actually a study done at this meeting that's being presented that shows that in the US, black race is associated with, le with late diagnosis and therefore worse outcomes. So it's really critically important that we teach trainees and others that although CF is most common in whites, it can actually occur in any race or ethnicity. You have likely heard the reference to the 10% of people who won't qualify for modulators based on their genotypes. In this study, they actually looked at that question, not just in Caucasians, but in people of color. And you can see that the number of people who do not have a copy of F508 is 10% in the white population, but in Hispanics, Blacks, Asians, and even Native Americans, that percentage of people 
who do not have a copy of F508 Dell is even higher than 10%. The pandemic has taught us that there are systemic issues of bias that lead to health inequality in the United States. And so people who are already at a disadvantage because of health inequality and because of late diagnosis are also less likely to qualify for CFTR modulators. So we really need to consider this as we think about drug development. The final group that we need to think about is based on the global view of Lex Tez Iva access. Here in the US, we are incredibly fortunate to have had early approval of Lex Tez Iva. And there was a recent announcement that in parts of Europe and the UK, they also will now have access to Alex Teziva. There are other parts of the world where they're actively seeking approval of Alex Teziva. However, I've just told you that CF can occur in any person of any race or ethnicity. And there are a number of places in the world where there is no plan to gain Alex Teziva for the people there. So as a global community, we really need to consider how we can help obtain access for everyone with CF. So usually at this point in the plenary, I'd be talking to you about the late breaking abstracts and hot off the press data from phase two and phase three trials. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, the pandemic really did curtail the work of clinical trials for quite some time. However, data from the CF Therapeutics Development Network tells us that most clinical trial sites are now up and running again. And we have an incredibly robust pipeline. So we're continuing to study the restoration of CFTR function, improvement of mucociliary clearance, decrease of inflammation and infection, and improvement of gastrointestinal outcomes. Around the time of IVACAFTER approval, Former President Obama said, I want the country that eliminated polio and mapped the human genome to lead a new era of medicine, one that delivers the right treatment at the right time. In people with CF, this approach has reversed a disease once thought unstoppable. And that is something that everyone listening online played a role in helping to achieve. So you really should stop and give yourselves a round of applause. Now, of course, former President Obama was speaking just about the US, but what has become increasingly clear over the last 10 to 15 years is it is absolutely critical for us to work together as a global CF community to develop new therapies so that we can get effective treatments to every single person with CF. So in summary, highly effective treatment has become a possibility for the majority of people with CF. Real world studies are ongoing and upcoming to understand the broader impact of highly effective modular therapies in people with CF. There's also a robust pipeline to continue to ensure the development for effective therapies for everyone with CF. And with that, I'd like to stop and say thank you. Thank you to the people with CF and their families who participated in the research studies. Thank you to all of the participating CF research centers, in particular for the development of this talk and the videos, Jenna Vince, Genevieve Mall, and Ali Sue Patterson from the CF Foundation. I'd also like to thank JP Clancy for his advice and his willingness to let me step a little bit outside of the box for this presentation. And finally, Dr. Frank Accurso, who took me under his wing when I came to Denver and really taught me how to do clinical trial design and conduct and continues to be an exceptional sponsor and mentor even well into his retirement. Thank you.